to completely change the game because it has um, several orders of magnitude more performance than disk drive and orders of magnitude more capacity than disk. Yesterday we announced our first refresh of our product line. We introduced a product four years ago that um, took us from 5x nanometer flash through 4x nanometer flash and 3x nanometer flash, so three generations of flash lithography. Over that time frame, this exact same hardware uh, platform uh, doubled in performance and maintained endurance even with the degrading flash. Now we're moving to the next generation platform, 2x nanometer, maintaining uh, uh, and improving endurance reliability, but also more than doubling the performance level. So this, this matters because you can monetize the speed at which you can convert data to knowledge. Now, VSL notwithstanding, VSL is, you know how I feel about VSL. It's a secret sauce that nobody else has. I've been on record as saying that. But um, EMC yesterday, Pat Gelsinger announced that its PCIe flash card was in beta. Mm -hmm. They announced the beta availability to customers. Now, that I, I, I want to understand, I've always asking, all right, how big is Fusion IO's lead? We know there's a lead. Sure. Uh, Pat Gelsinger conceded that lead, actually, on theCUBE, um, yeah. to his credit. He was open about it. Um, if you compare what they're shipping today from a technology standpoint, again, VSL notwithstanding, because that's sure, not part sure. of the equation, to you know, when you shipped your first beta, first of all, how long ago was that, and yeah. what's the technology difference? Because obviously sure. technology has progressed in those yeah, sure. two or three or four years. So we've been in the market now for four years, um, and uh, OEM our product through HP, IBM, Dell, which means it's been certified and hardened within each of those server environments. Um, and the support, the VSL, has been ported through Windows and Linux and VMware's ESX, even Solaris. Uh, we're announcing with this last release OS 10 support for guys wanting to use it in a workstation space, kind of a tangent market, but fun. And uh, also support for HPUX on the Itanium. So, you know, this um, breadth, because really, when operating systems were, were first being built, you had disks and memory. We're introducing something that's not strictly disk, not strictly memory, and that means a very tight integration at the operating environment level. So we view this more as a, as a, as a question of uh, the operating environment at the server. Um, and, and, and really what's going on here is, Storage has been serving two masters. One is the retention of data and the management of data through time so it doesn't get lost. And the other one is the delivery of data into processors so that processors don't sit idle. That data delivery versus data retention are two completely different demand drivers. With Flash, you now have a way to completely bifurcate those demands and it has real implications for folks who have monetized the cross-coupling of those by charging on a per gig basis for performance. So that decoupling is what happens when you take the performance uh, out of the storage array and deliver it in a much more effective fashion from the server. Because customers are not going to pay twice to solve the data delivery problem, the performance problem. This, that's why this is particularly you know, a challenge for folks who've been making most of their business from the performance piece. So um, we think it's, uh, the bottom line behind all this is a huge market. And having more players in and validate the market space actually is very good for us because there's a lot, um, there's a lot of untapped market to, to grow into. So we had Pat Gelsinger up on the, on the monitor here. Mark Hopkins can, uh, pulled up the Pat Gelsinger clip um, and the blog post, or one of those. Um, so he did say, as Dave pointed out, that EMC's playing catch up to Fusion IO. So obviously as a startup that now has gone public and got big, um, EMC's big. You guys are growing really, really fast, now public. Um, how did that how did that happen? How did that go over well in the company? One, obviously you guys <laughs> love that, um, but oh. you've got Pat Kelsinger putting his guns on you. So yeah. like, uh, well, you know, it, Pat Kelsinger is a fierce competitor. He comes from the Andy Grove mindset. Yep. Um, you guys are I think, funded I think, and ready to compete, but he's, you know, it's EMC, they're huge. I think the statement is, if you're not in the tank, you're in front of the tank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that came from the EMC guys. No, in reality. Well, no, Pat said, if you're not out in front of the next wave, you're driftwood. So, oh, there you go, so, I didn't catch um, that one. But no, but he's a fierce competitor. You guys have to compete. You're now public, so 
everything's yep. out in the open. You got other people nipping at your heels, trying to yep. be relevant, like violin. But yep. EMC's obviously got Project they, Lightning. They, How are you going to compete with all that? They did the same thing with data domain. For the longest time, they said, "Oh, that's a niche, right? It's a niche, a niche. We can do that better." You know, two point what billion later. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, this is our bread and butter, selling this value proposition, supporting this infrastructure. Um, you know, EMC is definitely a fierce competitor, but um, you know, if the customer pays us a dollar to solve what would have been a $10 problem to solve in the storage array, can EMC afford to undercut us even? You know, it would cannibalize their business more than us. So uh, the, the more uh, noise they make in the market, the more awareness that drives that there is a better, more efficient way to solve the performance problem than paying the premiums within the storage array to try to get performance. So you're not necessarily in front of the tank, you're on the side. You're kind of um, growing in, in parallel well this, to EMC, because yeah. if, if they're going to have to cannibalize their business, what that means is they, they really can't go after you, so to speak, well, right now. They can, it, they can if we don't get big enough fast enough, they could go and lose money at specific accounts, right? Yeah. But that's, you know, we're, we're kind of the Pandora's box that gets opened. Um, we, because we, we are taking a direct route to market because we have the reputation of making our customers successful with enterprise customer support. So it's one of the things that really differentiates Fusion IO and presents kind of a, a, um, an enigma to the market is that you know, people look at our products and say, oh, you're selling a component. First, it's the software that makes it into a, a full systems and solution, but then more importantly, it's the fact that we are out articulating the ROI, helping customers um, change their infrastructure and use it, and, and uh, acting as a, an enterprise systems company. Because this is an opportunity to solve the data distribution problem the same way client server computing evolved away from mainframes and led to uh, you know, the advent of companies like Cisco yeah. solving that problem. <laughs> well, Oracle, if they had their way, they'd have a mainframe. That's what Larry was basically presenting <laughs> up there in his keynote. But let's talk about Java 1, because right now, it's Oracle Open World's here, obviously Oracle, but Java 1's going on, got a developer community. Um, MySQL they own, NoSQL's the hottest trend in sure. the unstructured market. So there's this, there's a big gap between unstructured and structured data. People yep. are trying to make sense of it. Do you throw more, Fusion I.O. at the problem, makes it faster, unstructured is a new, with new market. How, do you, uh, are, how are you playing in that with your products and what does your future outlook look like with that marketplace? So the, one could view it as kind of like three, three separate things. One is structured versus unstructured. The other one's in memory you know, uh, versus, versus on, on disk. disk. And another one is acid transactional compliant versus loose, loose consistency models. Um, the advent of very high performance density flash addressed through the storage APIs makes it possible to take legacy applications written to use storage and make them look as if they were entirely in memory without having to recode them because it is non-volatile memory so your persistence stays the same and you don't have to go and build it to distribute it across a whole bunch of machines. So it lets you take legacy storage oriented applications and immediately move them into a world where you can manage and manipulate very large quantities of data. From a, um, a uh, structured versus unstructured, uh, the, the very high random access rates, the ability to go and collect pieces, you know, makes a big difference to, versus having to sequentialize it and your data layouts on the media no longer matter as much. Yeah. And lastly, with the consistency model, the um, atomic write primitive that we just introduced helps close the gap so that you don't have to go through and double write and do other, uh, you know, complicated mechanisms in the software to be able to guarantee consistency on the medium. So obviously you guys are in an exciting space. Um, performance wise you guys are killing it, you're doing great in the big accounts. Um, not under threat directly right now by EMCs and the big guys, but the world's changing. You know, we, sure. uh, we see Facebook, we see Apple, we see Google doing all these cool things. The new architecture of, of new clusters, uh, you mentioned client server, we see it now unstructured. Um, I interviewed uh, Waz, um, at the storage networking world, and he gets excited by new technology. So, you know, Apple announcing today the iPhone 4S and yeah. iCloud and iOS 5. All this is going on, they're now going to bring iTunes into the cloud. Facebook obviously is a massive platform. You guys succeed in these environments really, really well. 
Yep. What is the design criteria? Can you talk specifically about why you guys are excelling in environments like Facebook? Mm. I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, I wrote a post when you guys were in a quiet period around uh, um, why you guys are successful outside of Facebook, yep. um, and it, that more people are going to look like Facebook in yep. the future, that more people are going to move to a bigger cloud environment. So Facebook, Apple, iCloud, Google, all these environments you do well in, so why? why? So Can you share the insight? It really boils down to a need and an awareness. Um, the, um, the folks who are trying to accomplish a scale that hasn't been attainable before are looking for ways to solve that challenge. And so there's a, there's a you know, somebody has to recognize there's a problem before they go and look for a solution. And we have over 1,500 customers, most of them in just normal run-of-the-mill enterprise, running everything from payroll systems to you know, doing movie editing. Um, it's, it's very horizontal, the solution, because it just has to do with how do you feed data most optimally into, into processing systems. But customers don't come to look for us until they recognize that there's a need. So that, that can come because you're trying to get a performance level that, um, that you aren't able to get. That's an immediate one. Um, or it can come because you're not able to fit within the cost structure. You can't just go and deploy another VMAX, right? Uh, so the, 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 the primary driver is awareness that there is a better way, that servers are inherently capable of 10 times the workload they generally get today because they're starved for data in a timely fashion. People don't recognize that fact because it's grown gradually over time to where there's just okay. So scale. Okay, so I buy that scale. But the scale for these uh, environments. Let's take Facebook for example. Facebook is not your typical Oracle account. I mean, they might have Oracle that out there to run paid to make the paychecks get printed out properly in a workflow environment. No, they, but you know, um, they they're use not, MySQL. Yeah, they use MySQL. And they don't use Oracle. Exactly. My point is, they well, don't actually, use, they do they use Oracle. Oh, oh, they, <laughs> oh, they do. My, okay, MySQL. Well, not the Oracle in the sense that Larry wants. Well, Larry, Larry was very clear. He wants to sell his own IP, yep. yeah. and Oracle's model is one vendor lock in and own it. Right. So you're successful in environments where there's diversity of, of architecture, from commodity hardware to Hadoop and other environments. Yep. That's an architectural change. So talk about um, some of those factors around the scale, because these are like, the Facebook is scaling every day, so sure. why there? Well, uh, you know, it is um, a powerful implement for solving these problems that is available to be integrated in a number of ways. So I think there's a certain amount of flexibility. Uh, there are places where we are used as a substitute for memory and actually under applications that were originally written to hold everything in memory, like the caching layers of these web properties. And then there are places where we're used as a, as a faster disk. It's that flexibility, the fact that it is a very horizontal um, solution that makes it adaptable into these different environments. David, I wonder if we could uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the business decisions that you've made, you and your board as, as, uh, as a team. John and I were talking yesterday about uh, the merits and lack thereof of going IPO. Um, mm. You chose to go the IPO route. I mean, you've seen Facebook and the, the, their, their ability to raise money, the valuations of, 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 of private companies. Why did you choose to go public? Um, you know, th there are lots of reasons to want to be a public company. Um, and for some companies, those matter more than for others. Um, from, from our point of view, we looked at it because there are trade-offs, there are costs to doing it. For one, you can't talk freely about things. <laughs> um, but um, the, I think the main driver behind this, um, is, for us anyway, is as an enterprise solutions company selling directly to end users and knowing that it is awareness that there is a better way to architect information systems. Um, having, uh, being a public company, uh, where people can recognize your growth and realize that it's a real concern and not, not some niche product. Now, of course, that has uh, the uh, cited side effect of drawing attention of folks like, like EMC to recognize that this isn't just you know, a small thing but has, has huge potential based on the growth rates. Uh, so um, so that's our, uh, that was our primary thinking is to accelerate the business adoption because this is a um, it's a market capture because if the, the, there are, um, like I said, there's a lot of customers who simply don't know that their server systems are capable of doing 
much higher workloads than they get today. And, and I guess you kind of just answered it, but, but, but same question around why NYSE versus NASDAQ, right? Mm. You know, um, that's, uh, that's a good one. It, um, <laughs> uh, you I can like tell us, NYSE. you can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> that took you to a better golf better outing. Deal. Well, uh, and, and, <laughs> but it does, I mean, there is, there is some brand value there. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there, um, back in the day, NASDAQ was cool for all the tech companies. You know, nowadays it-, it the, Stability, the, more stability to the uh, yeah, NYSE yeah. I, versus I, NASDAQ, I was, or no, I, am I putting I, words in your mouth? I was taking a tour at the New York Stock Exchange literally a month to the day after the flash crash. And it's a slander on you know our, our dear product yeah. Flash. It was the <laughs> it was the the big uh, blip where the market dropped right. so fast. It was very interesting, you know, to see how uh, the systems that were in place at the New York Stock Exchange were ultimately what the SEC required of the industry to help solve the problem. They already had it in place. I also wanted to talk about Utah, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, plenty of companies have had made it huge outside of Silicon Valley, but. But Silicon Valley is the epicenter of all this innovation, John, as, as you know. How did Utah come about, and mm. is that a, uh, an advantage or a disadvantage for you, and why? Well, there's an interesting story there. I went to school in Utah, and uh, coming out of school, I and uh, two coworkers who were also in college at the same time, um, went to work for Oracle. Started a satellite R&D office in uh, Salt Lake City um, as part of uh, the uh, the effort to build a web browser. So this was months before the browser war broke out between Netscape and uh, Microsoft, and Larry Ellison had aspirations to go into the browser business. This is the early 90s, right? The early 90s. And you got WordPerfect was exactly. out there too, right? And WordPerfect, well, at that, just you know, a few years Novell, before that, you had Novell and WordPerfect, who were two of the top four largest software companies in the world. There is a lot of talent there, and yeah. it's very centrally located. Uh, you know, not very far from Seattle, not very far from the Bay Area here, Colorado, big storage hub. Great you lifestyle know, business. Hop, great lifestyle, lifestyle out there, you yeah. You know, one hop down to Texas, or our partners down there, so, you know, it's, it's very central in that sense. So I've worked my whole career from Salt Lake, generally working for a Bay Area company, uh, became, this uh, satellite R&D office became uh, the uh, one of the seed engineering groups that, that founded uh, NCI, Network Computer Inc., the thin client kick, yeah. which is, you know, old things are all new again. Now we have VDI yeah. going in that space. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thin clients so, so today at Oracle, it's kind of a slow day because of the Apple news, but yesterday in the keynote, big data is the center stage. Analytics, caching, a lot of people talking about big data, caching, mm -hmm. are the two hottest themes. Okay, caching, you mentioned a little bit about that. You guys have a play a big role in, in that architecture. Uh, big data, analytics. What's your view on analytics? Obviously real time, requires fast data. Um, it's on mobile devices, that plays well to your strengths. Yep. What's your view of the current state of big data and analytics, and how do you see that evolving? What's your vision, and what's Fusion.io's vision for big data? You know, there, there, there are contending visions for where that market goes, you know, and it mainly revolves around end memory, you know, versus using storage systems. And I think, you know, the, the, the traditional ways of delivering data from disk drives, it's known to be broken. So most big data assumes you have to put everything in memory, which means a big scale out model. Uh, when you introduce flash into the market, you now have the ability to use a more traditional scaled up model as opposed to scaled out in RAM. So it has some real implications for how those software um, uh, applications are authored to get their rapid supply of large quantities of data. The interesting thing uh, is that with IO memory, flash attached like a memory device using memory controller and memory management techniques, the, um, the, the cost per unit of bandwidth uh, from flash is actually less than that of disk. So most you know, big data stuff where you're using disk drives, you have to code it to use purely sequential access, and it's all about bandwidth. Well, even for just pure bandwidth, Flash, when integrated correctly, is now a more economic way to deliver um, to deliver the data. So, how about Open World? Um, talk a little bit about the show. What's going on here for you guys? Uh, maybe compare it to last time we saw you was VM yeah. World. Uh, it, it's amazing. We we kind of view the market through uh, two separate two separate uh, categories: things that are inherently data intensive, and those that aren't. I mean, you split it just like that. The ones that are really data intensive are the ones that generally take multiple servers and, and scale out or, or you have to really scale up your storage systems and make them really beefy. 
Um, the stuff that's not data intensive inherently is exactly the stuff that you virtualize so that you can pack a lot of them onto a single machine, right? So the VM world kind of represented the efficiency uh, where performance leads to consolidation and improved efficiency. And here, it's where performance leads to higher peak capabilities, right? So one is on the capability side of the market, and the other one is on the efficiency side and consolidation. Excellent. All right, David Flynn, you know, you're always a great guest. Appreciate you taking you. time out of your busy schedule to come here and uh, come Good. back anytime. We love having you on. Yeah, congratulations on the success so far. It's like I say, do it a hundred more quarters in a row and <laughs> we'll be good. Congratulations, Thanks, great David. to have you Thanks, on theCUBE. Right. David Flynn, CEO. Good.